I couldn't be more excited to introduce Sarah Duty on this episode of Design Today. Buckle up. I'm Dylan Winspear and the host of the Design Today podcast. Thanks for giving this episode a listen. I promise you it will not disappoint. There are a ton of options out there for people considering a career in UX and deciding to go down the boot camp route is pretty important for some. But after school, Sarah and I have both found that many talented individuals struggle to figure out what's next. She's created a program to help those types of students, helping them focus on improving their portfolios, their presence, and more. You can find more information about those programs in the details of this episode. Today, she shares a couple tried and true principles of what you should be doing and thinking as you approach your UX schooling graduation. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This is a a huge joy for me. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I had a little bit of like you know, starstruck celebrity status <laughs> having you come to my house going like, Sarah Duty's coming to my house to record. This is gonna be awesome. Uh, but you've done a lot and you're helping a ton of people. So that's why I think why this is so special. I always laugh when people say that because I think when you are in the middle of it, sometimes you don't realize it. And then like I go look at my Twitter stats or YouTube subscriptions and I think, oh, I guess I have an audience, you know, it wasn't, it you wasn't a master do. plan. I will definitely say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you definitely do have an audience. I mean, your YouTube videos have thousands and thousands of views. I mean, you've got a couple of those videos that, uh, 50, 60,000 yeah, views. 50, it's crazy. Uh, helping people address some issues that they're having in their resumes or their portfolios. I mean, you've got a lot of content out there to help designers who are in early stages of their, their career start to prepare for their career, exactly. prepare for the next step. So give us a little bit of an introduction to what you are doing now full time and and the, I guess the coursework that you put together to help these people. Right. So this all started really two years ago. Um, I had a problem with my inbox and I was really sick of seeing the same question. How do I make a portfolio? How do I break into a UX? Mm -hmm. And to be totally honest, I would put those in a folder and put it to do to respl reply uh -huh. and I would never reply or I would <laughs> reply to five and then get overwhelmed because it was just so frustrating to me. Yeah. And I thought in the back of my head and don't take this the wrong way, but I thought if you can't figure this out, you're not going to like survive a week in a role if you get hired. Right. So it was happening so much that I thought I have to do something about this. So I posted five videos on YouTube and one of them was that 50 or 60,000 view of how do I make a portfolio without experience? I think that's what it's called. Yeah. And that took off, which then led to this kind of gold mine of a topic opening up for me. Um, so since then, in the past two years, I've developed and prototyped uh, programs related to helping people create a portfolio and prepare for UX job interviews. Mm -hmm. um, and 1,100 people have gone through those programs to date. Um, they've been hired it's at incredible. companies. Yeah. I mean, when I, when I did the first one, two years ago, two years ago, this summer, the first person got hired six weeks after I taught the first beta and I made the curriculum for the first beta, like two days before I taught it. Uh -huh. That's a whole other episode of how did I like <laughs> prototype this beta? Cause I sold out the beta and then I had a wait list of a hundred people for the next one. Oh my gosh. Um, but totally different podcast, but she got hired. And then I thought, oh, I guess maybe there's something here. And then people were getting hired at Microsoft and Google and Deloitte and Salesforce and all these companies. But the transformation was huge. People would say, you know, I finally have my dream job or I have a salary increase of like 62% or something like that. And I thought I did not think my career would go this route, but this is a problem. And I, I think yeah. that the user researcher in me did what I always say, like be a problem spotter. Mm -hmm. And I just, I spotted the problem and then I would delete the emails. Yeah. <laughs> but then I thought I can't ignore this anymore. Yeah. And so now two years later, that's kind of where we are and it's taken over my business. I do about 80% of my time on this business, the portfolio career stuff. Uh -huh. And then the rest is reserved for really selective client work that I do. Um, yeah, and that's how I kind of got into 
full-time teaching, I guess, but really I dipped my toe into teaching back in 2011 when I uh, co-created the curriculum for General Assembly's right. first 12-week program back in New York. And, you know, it was twice a week in person, so much work. We definitely underestimated that. Yeah. But um, is it uh, fair to say General Assembly? Full circle now. Is it fair to say General Assembly was one of like the first UX schools that really kind to, of caught attention. Yeah, I, to my knowledge, I'm pretty sure. I mean, maybe there was something going on in San Francisco, but in New York, they were the kind of tech education yeah. hub, if you will. Yeah. Um, and I forget how that UX course even came to be. I think they did a couple of kind of happy hours about UX or something. A lot of people showed up or something like that. And then here we are. The crazy thing is, is at in 2011, UX wasn't really a, you know, at home name, right? Yeah. I mean, it was very early stages of, you know, who's catching on to this. Yep. Uh, I was doing UX, but, you know, my entry to UX was I was taking marketing principles from my degree and applying mm -hmm. them to design. And that's what I was calling UX. Right. And, uh, it wasn't until probably 2014 or 15, I started, maybe 14, that I started hearing like a name for this, like mm. this is UX. Yeah. I'm like, Oh, okay. That makes sense. And I think even back in 2014 or so, like prior to that mainstream in air quotes, yeah. it was so much about you know, user flows and wireframes yeah. and interface. Yep. And then this world of research started to get, yeah. you know, put on a pedestal a little bit. So it's nice to see kind of an even focus right now. But yeah. I, w when I say 2011, I think, oh my gosh, that was almost 10 years ago now. Yep. It's crazy. Yep. No, that's pretty awesome. Is it from General Assembly's experience that you had that little bit of a following then? I mean, you said your inbox was just flooded. Were they contacting you because they went through General Assembly or how did you already have that following? Great question. So this, I've been reflecting on this a little bit and this all started in the early stages of my career. Uh -huh. So I started out, okay, brief history. I was going to be a neuroscientist because okay. I thought... I'm going to get into medicine. That seems like a secure, you know, well-paying sure. field. Then I thought, I don't want to go to school for that long. And I don't even like blood and guts. So I thought <laughs> neuroscience is nice, clean science <laughs> to yep. pursue. Um, but then I took a year off and ended up dabbling in graphic design, web design, et cetera, um, and kind of fell into this world of user experience. I don't even remember what year. I read uh, Lou, Lou Rosenfeld's book, information architecture for the World Wide Web. He had a co-author. I forget his name. Okay. Sorry. Um, but I thought to myself, okay, if I want to get into this, I need a portfolio. And the wheels started turning of need a portfolio, need a website, need a presence. I I have a marketing degree. So I thought, how will I market myself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, I think it was all very, very subconscious. But I had the website, which I coded on my own. And then um, I started writing. I just, and I didn't know what to write about. So what I would do is if I read a fast art, fast company article I liked, I would kind of write a response. Yeah. Or if I was reading a book for my undergraduate degree, I would kind of like repost an essay or something like mm -hmm. that. And that writing developed this habit of reflecting, responding, getting to become a better writer. Yep. And that, and I joined Twitter and those two things, I think, were the catalyst okay. because I was active on Twitter and I could point people to these articles. And yeah. the reason that General Assembly ever happened for me was because I wrote an article on UX Magazine, I don't even remember what year, probably 2010 or 11, called Why We Need Storytellers at the Heart of Product Development. Okay. Another podcast episode. Okay. That went viral on Twitter. Like I had people from Harvard messaging me on the phone with people from Stanford. I mean, and how, I don't even remember how old I was at the time, like 20, early, mid 20s, something like okay. that. And um, the CTO of Pixar emailed me. We had a phone call, uh, Oren Jacobson. And I'm like, this is crazy. But that's how kind of General Assembly happened because they someone read an article and said, oh, Sarah knows user experience. And that was it. That's so cool. <laughs> I mean, what a wild experience. And it also speaks to like the success that you could have early on in your career, right? And yeah. just being able to articulate your thoughts and get things documented on paper. Like you don't have to be 
30, 40 years old and start to have the success. And the the thing that's interesting about my career, and maybe I'm too close to it and I'm discounting my experience, but a lot of people, especially, you know, friends that don't understand UX or even my parents, you know, I had opportunities to work at Google and I turned them down twice. They'd headhunted me and my dad was like, are you sure you don't want to go work at Google? Uh-huh. But I think that it's a testament to the myth that just because you have some name on your resume is a guarantee to success or the lack of that is going to hinder you. Yeah. Because sure, that could be a stamp of approval, but it's more about your ability to communicate, to articulate your ideas, um, to just have kind of like decent social abilities and things like that. 100%. Yeah. So without uh, spending much more time on that, because we've got a really packed topic that we want to get into. (laughs) So what we're going to talk a little bit about is you graduated from your boot camp. Now what? Right. Right. So why is that something that's, I guess, so close to you? So again, I think it's the problem spotter, user researcher eyes that I have because in doing a lot of research in parallel with coming up with the UX portfolio program that I do, I have a lot of data. Mm -hmm. And I know that a large percent of people who come to me are in a boot camp or just graduated. Yep. And this is not, you know, a shot at the boot camps, but a lot of them say, as a part of the program, you will have a portfolio or you will, you know, have job uh, search and job interview preparation assistance. The reality is that's not happening to my knowledge because people are coming to me to buy my programs to teach that. Yeah. And I have paragraph long responses and every single interview, phone call interview I do with students, it comes up. So um, that's kind of where it all started. And so again, we've already talked about some of what you've done over the last couple of years, but uh, when you've got somebody who, I don't know, reaches out to you on your contact form or they've got questions like, what is the first thing that you tell them? Where do you tell them to start? So the first thing that I tell them to do is that you have to think of yourself like a product because thinking about your own portfolio and your job search, it's kind of like you're a founder of a startup. Mm -hmm. And the traits of founders of startups, especially early on, is that they get really emotionally attached. They take too long to make decisions or they don't make the right decision because like their their hands are holding on so tight to their, you know, idea. And so what they need to do is kind of step outside of it a little bit and think objectively. So by having UX uh, professionals uh, from these boot camps kind of step back and try and see themselves as a product, I think it helps them kind of get out of the emotion of it. So the first thing that you really need to think about is, okay, what makes successful products great? To me, it's really three things. They attract the right customers. They prove their value to those customers slash prospects. And then after they've attracted the right people, um, proven their value, then those products convert. So attract, prove their value, and convert. Yep. Um, and that's what makes great products. Right. So if you can think to yourself, how can I attract the right potential employers, recruiters, et cetera? How do I prove my value? And then how do I convert maybe interested people or interviews into offers? That helps give you a framework rather, rather than thinking to yourself like, oh my gosh, I don't know where to start, you know? And then you work on it for a weekend and delete your portfolio and start again next weekend. Yeah. So when they start to attract potential prospects, what are they doing to attract those prospects? So you kind of have to think to yourself, this is not just about going on LinkedIn when you're ready to start applying, going on LinkedIn, toggling whatever that setting's called, and then like hoping people start to contact you. Yeah. And I'm available or whatever like, that yes, title switch is. I didn't realize like people do that yep. because I have never done that in my career. And if I did, it was by accident mm-hmm. through some UX weird thing on LinkedIn. But um, it was shocking to me to hear people say, yeah, like I just turned on the I'm available. And then I sat back and waited for people to contact me. And I thought, this is insane. Like when I was job hunting, I was scouring message boards, job 
postings, company websites, et cetera, reaching out to recruiters. And so in order to do that attracting, you need to think of what is the ecosystem of me? Yeah. <laughs> so there are many parts to it. There's maybe a web page, maybe there's social media presence, maybe there is um, in-person networking opportunities, maybe there is a LinkedIn profile. And so you kind of have to map out like what are all those touch points? What are those opportunities? And then make sure that the story that is happening on all of those moving parts is the same. Because what normally happens is when people come to me, maybe they focused all their time on their uh, portfolio, but their resume is terrible, their LinkedIn is terrible, and they have some uh, like really horrible cover letters and things like that. So thinking about, first of all, this ecosystem that you need to create. How are you teaching networking or how are you dictating that one uh or orating that that one to your your classmates or whoever is in, in this program? So networking is one of those topics that I feel like is really polarizing and people mm -hmm. get really freaked out about. It sounds intimidating. It sounds intimidating. And I mean, I don't like networking. I always sure. I always like avoided going to things in New York because it's just so awkward. And what I really recommend to people is that as great as in-person meetups are, I think they're really great to focus on the learning aspect. Don't make it a networking event. Use it as an opportunity to learn mm -hmm. from you know whoever's presenting. Concerning networking, I think it's far more effective to do it in all of the online communities that yeah. exist because it allows those relationships to happen a little bit more organically and gives people time to like marinate on the conversation rather than, you know, meeting a stranger in person and having some awkward exchange. Yep. Um, so there's so many, the great thing is there's so many amazing online UX communities out there that I think you just have to go into those and start to hang out. Yep. And the side tip I have is that a lot of the communities are huge, but you can find really great niche communities like user research communities or i mean i have a community that is only for discussing portfolios job search and interview prep i delete everything else uh -huh. <laughs> I kick people out uh -huh. but the power of that is that whenever people have a problem related to that topic they know where to go they know where to come yeah that makes total sense and the quality of the discussion is a lot, lot better because you know those people are swimming in that lane. You yep. know what I mean? And you're not going to get some surface level response from someone. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I try and I I guess I've shared with people, I guess, the metaphor of uh, it's, you know, networking is a lot like dating. If you yes. want to do it the right way, it's a lot like dating. Exactly. You can't just show up to a meetup and say like, oh, that speaker, he, he's from, you know, this company. I'd love to work there. After right. this is over, I'm going to go slide right in. Yeah. Speaking of sliding in, you uh -huh. just reminded me of something, though. Um, concerning these uh, groups, naturally, you'll probably encounter people that you want to, you know, send a message to right. privately or something like that. And I would just speak from personal experience and say that I probably need to write an article or develop a workshop on how to effectively, like, reach out to colleagues or people that or maybe a couple of levels ahead of you mm -hmm. and actually get a response. Currently in my LinkedIn inbox, I believe I have over 800 invitation requests. And that's a problem. So apologies if you tried to become my friend on there. I might be one of them. But um, I, <laughs> I feel like I might have said yes to yours, but yes. I just changed a setting. So now it's all like messed up. Yeah. But okay. the messages part of LinkedIn, it blows my mind how um, clueless people are to how to compose a good email to someone that you would like to get advice from. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll make a template or something, but yeah. it, first of all, like go Google that person first and see if they have a website and yep. see if they've already answered your question. Yep. Second, don't ask questions like, can I pick your brain? At the flip side, don't, um, send your life story. Someone did this to me once. I looked how many words it was. It was 3,000 words. And I thought, <laughs> I am not responding to this, you know? How so, much of it did you even read? Exactly. Okay. So I um, I would really recommend, like, get specific with your questions. Make it easy for that person to respond to you. You know, don't, don't just uh, kind of 
see someone that you look up to and think they're going to be my silver bullet if they just answer my email, I know I'll have an amazing career because Ooh. it doesn't work like that. Well, and Sarah, <laughs> I, I I know you a little bit now, and I would I would venture to guess that in those scenarios, you're always well intentioned. You know, like somebody reaches out to you, I know you're not going like, well, screw that person. Exactly. Like, I know you're well intentioned. I mean, you even said earlier that you put these emails into like a reply folder. Yeah. But then it gets overwhelming. Exactly. And I even, I know I don't have nearly the amount of incoming you know, messages that you have, but it's sometimes well intentioned, I just forget things, you know, or I read yep. it at work or in a meeting and then I just forget to come back to exactly. it. Exactly. Things slip through the cracks. Uh, if you're okay with it, let me share a quick story. Yes. I had, uh, she, her name's Jennifer. She, I, I think the world of her, she's helped me with the podcast now for about the last six months, but she and I originally connected about a year and a half ago and she sent me an email that I will never forget. Um, it was in this phase where I had posted something that we were hiring at Domo. I got flooded with 50, 60, 70 emails within 48 hours. Wow. And I couldn't go through all of them. But when I scanned hers, like the very first sentence of it, and this is back when I had a real big beard. Okay. The very first sentence, she was like, I like your beard. We should talk about it. And I just yep. like started busting up laughing. And I started reading the rest of this email and she just kept going on and like nothing was even about UX. It was just like one joke after another about <laughs> like this beard. And uh, I didn't respond to her. But I tell you what, of all those 50, 60 emails that I went through that day, I went home and told my wife about one of them. <laughs> yeah. And because it, it stuck out. Now, we didn't connect at that point in time. It was about six, nine months later that I got another quirky email. Huh. And this, this second quirky email, which was like, hey, uh, I'd love to uh, chat with you about uh, about helping you on your podcast. Lunch seems too formal. You want to go bowling? And I <laughs> just <good>. started busting <laughs> a gut. And I was just like, who is it? She's got to be the same person who sent the, the beard email. Right. Sure enough, it was. And I had to respond this time. And since then, I've just learned that she's a fantastic human being huh. who knew how to get my attention uh, and has helped me tremendously. And I just think like, you know, there's there's a lot of ways to do it, but you're doing it the same way everyone else is doing it. Whether like you said, you know, hey, could you give me some advice? It's just being overdone or sharing their life stories, being overdone. Exactly. I, I don't have time for it. Well, that example is a really um, great example of something that uh, someone else taught me, which is called anchoring. Mm -hmm. So when you are reaching out in Jennifer's case, she didn't start with like, dear hiring manager, my name is Jennifer, blah, blah, blah. Right. She had an anchor, meaning she was able to pick out some interesting fact, some commonality, uh -huh. some icebreaker, I guess yeah. is a better way to put it, yeah. to catch that person's attention. Yep. And so when I tell my students, like, after you've applied to a company, if you don't know anyone there, the best chance you're going to have is to network your way to someone inside that company. Exactly. And so they say, okay, well, how do I do that? And I said, well, go into a Facebook group or LinkedIn group and say, hey, I just applied at uh, Domo mm -hmm. and I don't know anyone there. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear more about the design culture, the interview process. Can anyone like give me some advice? Yep. That way the ask is not guys, can someone pull some strings at Domo, which sounds right. desperate. Instead, it just the way you ask the question. Yes. But then if someone responds, um, then you can reach out to them and maybe you go cruise their LinkedIn. And if you find that they've been at Domo for six years, start the email with, hey, I noticed you've been at Domo for six years and you also you know, earned a snowboarding or yep. something. I yep. love snowboarding. Those messages are going to stand out way more way way more yeah and it's natural it's organic and yeah. i think that's that's the piece that uh really starts to stand out and you know it might not be like an overnight success like cool i connected and now next week i got an interview right it could be months that this kind of relationship built naturally and, yeah you know sarah posts something on linkedin and you comment on it and then a couple months later you, you see something else and you can have another exchange and for me it's been like when i can see a name kind of pop up consistently i know that mm -hmm. we're we're not like actively trying to build something, but I, I know that there's common ground that the bricks have been laid in the past. Mm -hmm. And that really seems to help. It's like your dating example. Like yeah. you can't go from like zero to hired uh -huh. in like two weeks because someone responded to your message. Like you're not going to marry someone after two weeks, right. I don't think. So you need it's to like probably out there. You're, let you that, are in Utah. There's probably a reality show about that. <laughs> <laughs> but you need to like let that grow organically. And maybe, you know, you did 
hear from Jennifer the first time and then two years later or whatever, she's working on your podcast. But you never know. And that's a good lesson for people too. Every interaction, everything you do, you never know where that's going to lead. Like my article I wrote for UX Magazine, I wrote it as a blog post out of frustration with the company I was at, more as like my own therapy. And then it went crazy on my blog. So I thought, I'll see if UX Magazine wants to post this. They posted it and then it just blew up. Yep. Let me jump now to a different topic. Yes. Students are in boot camps. Yes. Uh, How should they start thinking about their resumes or portfolios at this point in time? So the first thing they need to think about is getting really clear on who they are as a designer. Okay. And what that means is, let's flip back to our product analogy. Yeah. So with a product, if it doesn't have a solid value proposition or some like elevator pitch or something like that, it's going to be hard to tell people about that product, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or if that product just announces itself like a bullet list of features, like instead of for QuickBooks, maybe, because I just used QuickBooks this morning, like if QuickBooks just talked about you can send invoices and manage this and that. Like it just sounds boring. Uh But if they have a proper little elevator pitch, it's a lot better. So for you as a product, today you just can't say, I'm a UX designer because we don't have standardization in job titles. UX designer at Domo is different than Spotify, is different than Apple, is different than Hydro Flask. Uh, (laughs) I'm looking at your water bottle. bottle. (laughs) (laughs) But um, you can't say that because then recruiters and hiring managers are just saying UX designer and it means something different. So what you need to do is come up with an elevator pitch of yourself. What I might say, instead of saying, hi, I'm Sarah, I'm a UX designer, I would say something like, I'm Sarah. I'm a user researcher and experience designer. Okay. That's a lot clearer. Still, those words could mean different things, but at least now we're getting a little bit more granular. So someone could hopefully make the assumption that I don't do visual design. I'm not a front end coder. Yep. To take it a step further, though, if that becomes my title, to take it a step further, you would want to develop kind of a little about me statement. Yep. I would say two or three sentences. This is going to further define feel like I need a whiteboard, but further (laughs) define what I'm a user researcher and experience designer means. So that might translate to, um, I specialize in uh, conducting user research to help equip like product teams with, you know, the information they need to make better decisions. And I also then take what I learn in research and develop product strategies and experiences. That's a little long, But you can see what that did. That almost like begins to define what do I do in the world of research and experience design. Then to get to your point about um, Jennifer, I might add in some stuff at the end of that. Like I'm passionate about healthcare or I'm really interested in how technology can help, you know, education for children with disabilities or something like that. That way, when someone's reading that statement about you, you're not just Sarah, the UX designer, but they mentally start pegging, oh, the one that was really into healthcare or the one that, you know, was all about accessibility or something. Yep. Where are their portfolios located? Where are these taglines <laughs> located? Yeah. So the the tagline of user researcher and experience designer, that should be like on your uh, LinkedIn title. I forget yep. what that field yep, yep. is. I think on your website, it should be at the top, like top left, it should say your name and what you are on every page. And also don't go make a cute logo with like nice fonts that you find and things like that. Like it just to me looks a little unprofessional. Um, I just rather keep it clean. Like sometimes I think it's weird that you have a logo for yourself, unless maybe you're a visual designer. Sure. But yeah, keep it right there. Then where does this compass statement go? Um, it should go on your homepage right at the top so people know who you are. Like if this was a product homepage, you wouldn't put the tagline or the, uh, you know, elevator pitch like in the, in the bottom third of the website. Right, right. Um, and then in your LinkedIn, I forget what the section is called, but kind of right below on the top left after I think your title, 
there is an area where you can add in like a little overview. You can also add in links. So you could add in links to articles you've written or mm -hmm. specific projects in your portfolio. Mm -hmm. The other cool thing is when you invest the time to write a really good compass statement, you can you then use that in cover letters or cut and paste that into bits of go. emails yep. or in social media. And what I tell my students is you will have a compass statement with our template template in air quotes. Mm -hmm. It's maybe four sentences, yep. depending on how big your sentences are. But you, what you put on your LinkedIn might only be three of those, yep. what you put on your Twitter. Because the thing with templates, this is like my recent rant, is that it's a guideline. Like, yeah. don't feel like with any template I have, I tell my students like, this is a guideline. Think of it like a wireframe. Yep. The visual designer is not going to do exactly what the wireframe says because we will find a better way in visual design. Sure. Because we just know better as we go. And you consider how does this feel? It feels too long. Don't put all five sentences. Right. <laughs> no, I think it's a good point because when you go back to your whole metaphor of the, the it's a product, right? You're thinking then all these touch points are like branding touch yes. points. And are you keeping your brand consistent? Exactly. So I like how you're saying like, just write these things once and then feel how to feel out, figure out how to integrate it into the different touch points that you have, as opposed to saying like, now I got to write a new one for LinkedIn. Right. Now I got to write a new one for my cover letter. Now I got to write a new one for whatever, whatever, you know? Well, the same goes with your portfolio. Um, because one of the awesome things is when you take the time to invest writing really great case studies, literally in Google Docs first, then after you spend a lot of time on those and make sure they answer all the right questions, now you have a Google Doc for each project you've worked on and you can use that content in your portfolio. You can also massage some of those sentences for your resume, yep. for your LinkedIn. Yep. You can pull, pull, bits of, pull bits of that for cover letters. And then also, whenever it's time for an interview, you can go back and read that case study the night before mm -hmm. and refresh your mind because mm -hmm. the thing that I'm a broken record about, but I'll, I guess I'll be talking about this for the next 10 years, yep. is that when you write this case study of a project in your portfolio, if that ends up being like 2,000 words, that does not mean that all 2,000 words come over to your website or come over to your PDF because that's a terrible user experience. No one's going to read that. Mm -hmm. But that story that you wrote out, that's the story yep. that you need to know inside and out. And the cool thing then, I've even had people take that Google Doc case study, turn it into an article on Medium or use it as the basis for like a talk at a local UX meetup or something yep. like that. So you mentioned Medium a second ago. I'll go back to this question of where your portfolio lives. Yeah. Is this something that they should be building on Wix or Squarespace or WordPress? Or is this something that's just a local file that they send out to yeah. rec recruiters when they ask? What is this portfolio? So, I mean... I'm not going to say that there is one way and the only way. I'm going to talk through it, thinking about the UX of this, okay. right? So what's the job of the portfolio? Well, it's to let people know like your skills. And I always say, you need to think of your portfolio like it's a giant bag of evidence for a legal case. Okay. So everything in that portfolio needs to back up whatever you said in your compass statement. Yep. So if I said I'm a user research and experience designer, and there's no research in my portfolio, no one's going to believe me. Right. <laughs> um, but concerning like the experience of that, I think there's three things you could do. You could put your work on a portfolio uh, design platform, mm -hmm. such as Dribbble, Behance, et sure. cetera. You can have your own website, Squarespace, whatever, et cetera. Or you can have it as a PDF. Now, to decide which one is best for you, the first thing you have to think about is, well, what's the experience of this for the user? They're obviously going to look at it when you apply, but it doesn't end there. You're eventually going to go to an interview. So the question you ask yourself is, what will I present in the interview? Mm -hmm. Personally, I think it would kind of be awkward if someone shows up and pulls up their Behance page to present a project. Click here. It just, click it here, feels weird, Absolutely. you know? Like it just, it's not normal to right, me. Right. <laughs> um, so I think if you work backwards, you know eventually you're going to need a presentation. Yep. So with my logic, maybe sometimes too logical, I think, <laughs> well, why would you have a PDF 
for a presentation. Right. And then have a website that then goes into all the same detail. Like it seems like duplicate work because I have now realized people do this. Like they have their entire portfolio and then their entire website and it's all the same content. Right. And then when I tell them after I review their portfolio and say all the things that are wrong, they're like, oh my gosh, it's going to take me so long to update it. And I say, why do you need both? Why don't you just have a PDF and then you have a website that's a home base that gives people previews of your work, like snippets, appetizers, and then the call to action on your website is like what you see to see more, like request my portfolio. Simple. The cool thing when you think about that is on your website, you could have them contact you to get the the, uh, portfolio which gets you an email connection to that person and you can have a conversation. Right. Or if you just want to make it a free-for-all, link to the PDF. But if it were me, I would make people contact me so then I can have a conversation with them. Yep. Um, and you have to kind of put on a little bit of a marketing hat. Yep. Um, the concern that I have with websites is don't use it as an opportunity to learn how to code. This yeah. myth, I believe myth, Designers have to learn to code. I don't believe it. I think you should be technically literate. You know, if you're in a room with the developers, you can't like, you know, want to run out of it or something. Uh You have to be technically literate. But it's not a chance to go learn HTML and CSS because if that's the first time you're making a website, it's not going to be very good. There's a lot of people slow clapping for you right now. And there's a lot of like risk. What if it doesn't work on mobile, et cetera? Then the risk with portfolio design platforms Dribble, Behance, whatever is Adobe's is, et cetera. The concern I have with those is that they were not intended, at least to my understanding, to be portfolio websites. They were intended, thinking specifically about Dribble and Behance, like as uh, places to show off Showcase. your final product yep. and to show bits of interfaces, yep. right? So there are not a lot of um, parts of your profile page on there to really get into the detail and have text. And also it's getting into the weeds, but like properly format that text to, you know, on medium, you can kind of adjust the font size with different headings and subheaders and things. But on those websites, I don't know that you can, or if you can, people aren't doing it. The other problem though, is that in addition to not being able to showcase your process really well, and it would be weird to pull up your Behance in an interview, is that if you are sending recruiters to your Behance profile, guess what? They're like one click, one millisecond away from being able to jump off to someone else's because they see something in the sidebar or they search. Right. So it's like, if you have a website, you've at least corralled people into the world of you. Mm -hmm. Uh, PDF, same thing, potentially even better because then it's not a website maybe they're op- maybe they're reading that in preview where there's not a Google search bar at the top and yep. they're gonna you know find like their next vacation or something. And, and I've also found that sometimes we needed to print them, and so a PDF is gonna print a lot easier too. True, that's a good point. And like you hire people, so yep. you can speak to that. Um, but yeah, I think like before you jump into your portfolio, think about like how will I use this? When will I use this? And what is kind of the flow of someone as they first learn about me? That's awesome. Um, so that's why I just like, I really, really encourage, I don't force, but I encourage my students have the PDF and the, the constant feedback I receive is, and I'm paraphrasing, once I decided to make my portfolio as a PDF, it went 10 times faster. I've been working on my website for six months. I finished my portfolio in two weeks. Like, it's because yep. you think the websites are going to be easy to use. I tried to help a friend with Squarespace a couple of years ago uh, to make a little website for her fashion thing. It was so hard. I was probably overthinking some of it, but basic things I thought I'd be able to do, could not do. Right. Um, and yeah, I probably we- wanted to do more than the average user, but we could have just done it way faster as a PDF. <laughs> when I found for even myself personally, I always joke because I, I give interview advice and resume advice, portfolio advice. Well, my portfolio on my website hasn't been updated in about three years. Yeah. Because again, it took a huge effort to get it Exactly. Up, but I can't go back and do it. I don't have time to go back and update it now. You reminded me of something. The other reason I'm making a case for PDFs, but I'm not mandating it, so don't uh-huh. tweet me, 
uh, is that when you apply to roles, you should customize your portfolio for every role you apply there to. There you go. So how do you do that if it's a Behance? Or how do you Great do that point. if it's a website? People have told me they can do it on a website, but I think that sounds like a lot of work. If it's a PDF, what you need to do, and the beauty of the PDF, is you have one master file for your pres for your portfolio, which has every project you want to include mm -hmm. forever. Mm -hmm. Then I apply at Domo. I think to myself, okay, open up the keynote, make a duplicate. Then I start to customize the portfolio for Domo because I think, oh, this project really relates to whatever the job description says. I'm going to move it up to the top or I'm going to delete these two that have nothing to do with anything that Domo would care about yep. because I have studied the job description and identified the things they're looking for, which also amazes me how much people don't do because they just see UX and job titles and hit apply, apply, apply. Yeah, it's all the same. It's crazy. Yep. <laughs> and it's funny because our our hiring at Domo is it's enterprise UX. And enterprise UX is very different than just like a B2C exactly. uh, app for somebody who wants to rent a bike. I mean, yeah. it's, it's very different. And so when they come in with uh, specifying in their portfolio where they've got enterprise experience, it's already a huge plus one for that yeah. individual. We're already looking around the room going like, They've got enterprise experience. Right. And if they can articulate in that portfolio and then also in the interview be able to say like, well, I decided to choose this project because I think it's a great example of, you know, enterprise onboarding. Mm -hmm. And even though it's in, you know, some other industry, I know I noticed in the job description, blah, 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 or in my conversation, yeah. that that's an example of like anchoring, as we talked about earlier you know, in real life. Yep, absolutely. So we've covered a couple of those first steps. I think the last step we talked about was converting. Yes. So share with me a little bit of the tips or tricks that you have for converting now. We, we, we're starting, it sounds like we're starting to touch on it. Right. So converting, yeah. Once you are attracting uh, the right people and you have the home base, the ecosystem set up, what do you do once people start to express interest in you? Mm -hmm. And how do you go from, oh, I got a first phone call with a recruiter to I have an offer. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be different for every company. But I think the tip I have for new graduates is to remember that um, you really need to be patient. Because even though UX is really hot right now, I think there's just this myth out there that you'll be hired within two weeks of graduating or something. Mm -hmm. And it is a long road because um, there's a lot of competition out there. Supply and demand. So I think you really need to set your expectations. And the other thing to think about is if you're just starting out and your dream is to work at Uber and you don't have any experience yet, that's probably going to be very hard. Yep. So adjust your expectations of not like the dream company you want to get and think about you know, what do you need right now at this stage in your career? Yep. That's going to help you waste less time on applying to roles that aren't a fit for you. Or if you really want to work remote, then do research before you apply and don't apply to the companies that are re are not remote friendly. Yep. Um, but once you do start to get interviews and contact with people, the real, real thing that I think people are missing is that you need to kind of pretend you're a salesperson, mm -hmm. get into the mindset of like proper follow up. If you don't hear from someone like in a week, email them back. Or if you don't hear, go into um, the groups we mentioned earlier and ask people like, hey, does anyone know how long the interview process is or did it take a while? And start to try and put feelers out to either understand that uh, interview process a bit more or follow up with people. Yep. And you won't always get a follow up. It's just the way the world works. But I don't think it's bad to do two, even three follow ups if you're not hearing because these people are busy. They've got a lot going on and they might be on vacation, maybe the time of year. But it amazes me how many times people don't follow up. You know, we're about to hire someone uh, who completely fell off my list of people who I wanted to interview. Because when I got flooded this last round, I was telling you about those internships we, or the uh, positions we were just filling. Mm -hmm. uh, I had lists and there was probably like 30 some people that we wanted to do phone interviews with. Mm. And this individual just somehow fell off my list. And she reached out again and hmm. said, hey, 
is this still happening? Is there any way I can get you know my foot in the door here? And I'm like, oh my gosh, thank you for reminding me. Yeah. Throw on the list, and it turns out she's going to be one of them who ends wow. up getting an offer. Wow. And it never would happen if she didn't do that follow up email. And there's you a heard balance it here. <laughs> exactly. And, and there's this balance between be patient uh, and and then remind. I am a person who, as long as you don't think I'm stupid, as long as you don't think less of me, I appreciate the reminders. Mm -hmm. Thank you for staying on top of this. Mm -hmm. uh, I had somebody come in and shadow the other day, and she scheduled this. Sh like, reached out to me and said, I'll, "I'll put it on your calendar." Thank you so much, right? Because I just don't have a minute to put it on my calendar. Yeah, I mean, think of your own email inbox. How many times, or text messages? How many times you forget to reply to someone? It's not that you're a jerk. It's just you forgot. You know, mm -hmm. things fell off the radar. So really, really remembering to follow up, but also concerning the um, job search process, you need to treat that like it's a part-time slash full-time job and yep. have proper project management around yep. that. So don't leave notes you know, in a notebook or on your iPhone or something or have little stickies everywhere like make a Google Sheet, make a Trello board, make a whatever works for you and like project manage your own, um, your own interview process in your job search yep. and get granular. Like, do I know anyone there? Have I asked in Facebook groups, et cetera? Um, I have a template and it's kind of, it's for my students. It's kind of over the top, but they all say like, this is so helpful because I used to have it all in email or folders or a notebook and you forget. Yep. And I appreciate you sharing those things. One of the things I also get a lot of uh, people concerned about is application tracking systems. Mm. And they, I get asked all the time, like, should I create two resumes? Mm -hmm. One with the buzzwords that gets me through the application tracking system and then one that I'll actually hand off to the interviewer. What are mm -hmm. your thoughts on that? So I think it's, you know, true that these application tracking applicant tracking systems, however you say it, yeah. exist, right? Which I think is why you should be really careful not to overly design your resume. I see so many resumes that are just too much of an art project. And mm -hmm. again, people have not thought about the user experience of the resume. Or they try and shove it all on one page. And then it means as a result, you're compromising like the details of the content that you're putting into it. So should you have a second one? I don't think you need two because I think... A, that's extra time, and B, kind of, this isn't a design, a visual design exercise. Like, yeah. this is just show me the information. Plus, your LinkedIn should be telling a similar story as well. And I think eventually they're going to get to your portfolio. So spend your time on your portfolio. Yeah. Um, I had another thought, but I forgot. <laughs> no, I think that's great because, I, again, people get caught in the weeds of like, I'm in their mind, they're, they are conversion optimizing. Okay, so I'll, I'll create this one for this system, then I'll create this one to get in here. Yeah. Like, I, I get it, but I also feel like you're over-optimizing. I think there's better ways to spend your time to make yourself hireable. You just reminded me. So whenever people apply on websites, I always say to my students, like, okay, you applied. That's nice. It's in a black box. Let's assume no one's ever going to look at it. Yep. What do you need to do? Need to connect with someone on the inside or yep. try. That's why this uh, networking, especially online networking, is so important, especially because if you go into a group and post, then that one post is getting a lot of eyeballs on it. If you're at a networking event and you're talking one-on-one, -on -one, then it's going to take you 50 times longer to get to the answer, whereas in a Facebook group, you might have like 20 responses by tomorrow morning. Yep. But it all, again, goes back to your ability to be you know, a socially competent human being, mm -hmm. not sound like you're begging in these Facebook groups, asking thoughtful questions or doing research in the group before you even ask the question. Cause yep. someone may have already said, does anyone know what the interview process is like at Domo or does anyone, you know, right. et cetera. So, um, yeah, I mean, spend a little bit of time optimizing, but uh, rely on humans. Don't rely yeah. on the robots. You know, and that's fair because I've, I've shared with many individuals that w as they start to get into the weeds of like, this conversion optimization via their resume and their portfolio. Like mm -hmm. maybe if I just tweaked this in my portfolio, I'd get hired. And, right. And I go like, it's already good. Like, you, you know, there's things that we can make better. It's already good. Yeah. What I think you need to do more of is this networking piece or right. is this building relationship piece? Because I personally, and I don't know if you can speak for yourself, I personally have never landed a job position based off of turning in a resume. It hasn't happened for me. No, same with me. I've always networked my way into a company. In fact, even when I started at Domo, uh, I had my offer in hand before they said, 
oh, by the way, we don't have your resume on file. Hmm. And yeah. then I sent it to him. Yeah. I think looking back in my career, like all of the opportunities have come because I knew someone or the IBM example, it came because someone had read an article I wrote. Mm -hmm. My freelance- Those touch points you talk clients, about. Clients, it's always, I read an article, I saw a tweet, I saw your YouTube video, I read your newsletter, you know? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of power in putting out quality content, but also content doesn't mean articles. It can mean your participation and presence in the community, whatever that community is to you. I, and I hope they, re, you know, rewind 15 seconds and listen to that again, because I feel like everyone- <laughs> I'll is, have to as well. What did what, I just say? <laughs> <laughs> everyone is so, I mean, there's low barrier to entry of writing a Medium article. Right. Low barrier of entry of writing a LinkedIn article or, you know, low barrier of entry in starting a podcast. Yeah. But there are other ways to create your content and it can simply just be getting involved, like you said. Exactly. No, because, you know, I, I look in the group I run for, um, I have a- group for my students and a group for anyone. And in the anyone group, there's like 5,500 people. I don't have time to answer all those questions, but I could pinpoint the people that are leaders in that group who always are chiming in to answer questions very, very thoughtfully. And mm -hmm. um, that gets noticed, yep. you know? Absolutely. Uh, we are about at time. I let this one go a little bit longer <laughs> because I'm really excited about this topic. There is so much here. So if someone wants to reach out and I guess learn a little bit more about you and about your work, what should they do? Well, you should not message me on LinkedIn. That's some That's generic. not what's going to work. Don't, don't try and slide into my DM anywhere. <laughs> you haven't listened to this episode if that's the Re -listen. case. Re-listen. Uh, because I'll just reply back with this episode. No, in all seriousness, the best way to learn more about me and what I'm doing to help you with your UX career um, is to head to the UX, no, UXportfolioformula.com. Okay. Uh, we'll link it up below. There's yep. no the. Um, and that's where you can find information. I have a ton of articles, how to get into my different groups. If you want to come into one of the programs, you can learn everything there. Um, but I have a big focus on content in the next couple of months. So that article section will be blown out a lot. Cool. Yeah. And for a lot of those who are listening on YouTube, you've also got a YouTube channel that's yes. uh, pretty robust as YouTube well. YouTube is uh, Sarah Duty, my name. Um, maybe in the next couple of months, we'll get more on videos. But there's UX career and job playlist right there with teardowns of UX portfolios, tips for job interviews, um, analysis of case studies that have gone viral. So there's tons of awesome information there. Cool. Anything else we need to plug? I don't think so. Okay, that's it. Thank <laughs> yeah. you so much for your time. This has been fantastic, packed with information. Thanks for having me. I, I obviously love talking about this topic. This is a great topic. Great. Hey, that's it for today. Thanks for listening to Design Today.